next we we invited uh, as i said uh, two speakers to uh, uh who have used uh, simpla before uh, to give us uh, their experience and to talk about uh, their feedback uh, michael uh, penn from stanford university uh, will speak first and then uh, jimmy wolf from the university of Mich michigan will follow so uh, michael please all right. <clears throat> well, let me start like everyone else with a quick screen share and to make sure that that is working. One second. Second for that. And quick confirmation that that's all set. Looks good. Fantastic. Yes. Great. So I want to start actually talking about visualizations. And that is that data visualizations often have a tendency to fall into two categories. The one we're most familiar with are those that are downstream from an argument. That is, a researcher goes through a lot of data, comes to hypotheses and conclusions, and then shares those with visualizations in something like, well, a PowerPoint slide. There's a field of data science called um, data that is that kind of switches this equation as referred to as visual analytics. What visual analytics does is it takes a very complicated data set and then uses data visualizations not to share arguments, but rather to form the arguments and analyze the data in the first place. For this to work, you need a fairly complicated data set. Now, as some of you know, I'm working on a book on Timothy the First. That is the Catholic coast of the Church of the East from 780 to 823. And Timothy has left for us a little over 60 of his letters, about 400 pages in translation. And these together give us an incredible plethora of details on the day-to-day -day operation of the Church of the East. And so as I've been designing my book project, increasingly I've been leaning into visual analytics because I have that sort of complicated data set uh, for which these tools have been designed. As a result, I anticipated doing a lot of social network analysis, something similar to what you see here, where each letter in this case that we have of Timothy's is a blue line, each recipient a dot. As you can tell from the visualization, Timothy has a tendency to write most of the letters that survive to his favorite pen pal and childhood friend, Sergius. This misdistribution, that is most of the letters being to one recipient, uh, becomes even more notable when we use comparative sets. So, for example, the letters of Jacob of Edessa are the closest I could find. But even here, Jacob's favorite pen pal certainly doesn't dominate the data set the way that Timothy's does. When we look to larger letter collections, such as the Catholicos Ishiab III, writing about a century before Timothy, or in the Latin universe, that of Augustine and Jerome, we see a much more common distribution, where even the most common recipient only receives a small portion of the entire corpus. All of this shows us how unusual Timothy's letter collection is and gives support to an argument made by Berti that the best way to account for this is that it's probably Sergius himself who curated and collected our surviving letters. Now, such a result is of great interest if you're writing a book on Timothy because it helps us know that what we have is a really biased set of letters just representing one facet of Timothy's life. Here's another example of a social network graph. In this case, the blue are the same letters we talked about before, those that survive. But perhaps more interesting is the plethora of these orange lines, each of these representing a letter we no longer have, but that Timothy alludes to in his surviving corpus. What this graph tells us is unlike previous scholarship, that generally was misled by Abdisho's metrical homily in which he's catalog, in which Abdisho says that Timothy had about 200 letters. Instead, we have over 200 just in terms of what survives and what's alluded to, suggesting Timothy himself probably wrote not hundreds, but rather thousands. 
Another way we can graph data is by looking at all the different place names within Timothy's letters. And in this case, each line represents the movement of an individual or of an object from one place to another. That's referred to in Timothy's letters. Not surprisingly, places where his favorite recipient Sergius lived, like Beth Lafat or Mosul, predominate. But other centers, such as Basra or Nisibis, are illuminated. Alternatively, we could use GIS to look at issues of geography to see how expansive are Timothy's horizons. And here we see as dots every different place that Timothy's surviving letters refer to. And in terms of geographical expanse, can measure as the crow flies that the distance between the two most distant places he alludes to is just 100 miles short of the distance between San Francisco and London. Again, reminding us of how vast is Timothy's world. We can also zero in on the world of an individual letter. In this case, letter 47, which is only about four to five pages long. But nevertheless, if you add up all the different movements that it refers to, it talks about movements over a distance of just one third of the circumference of the entire Earth. It also shows a very recurrent geographical pattern within Timothy's letters, where you have four far from peripheries, such as from Baghdad to Tibet. And yet, as this pink ellipsis shows, if you just look at one standard deviation, that is about 68% of the movement recounted in this one letter, it's in a much smaller area of Mesopotamia. And this becomes a recurrent pattern where Timothy speaks about very far from peripheries, but most of the action is extremely centralized. This is another um, example of this in greater detail, showing again every single movement of person or of objects within Timothy's letters and how that maps up geographically and also in terms of frequency. One can also move from geography to travel time, based not on how the crow flies, but rather on our knowledge of early Islamic road systems, um, giving us some estimates of what is likely closer to the actual time period it would take to require for it to move from Timothy being situated in Baghdad to the various locales that he speaks about within his letters. Alternatively, I'm also interested in memories of Timothy, and one can graph out both later authors that speak about Timothy about authors who include excerpts of Timothy's texts, as well as manuscripts that preserve the text themselves. One can also drill down, looking at how a specific author, in this case Thomas of Marga, who preserves our earliest extensive account of Timothy, how Timothy functions within that literary account and its character networks. You may have noticed that I've already used up half of my speaking time, and I haven't mentioned Simto once. The reason was, when I started this project, I didn't think we'd have anything robust enough to do the sort of corpus linguistics that is the actual look at a distant read of Timothy's text. And then I realized how wrong I was. That is, even using the last version of Simto, one can fairly quickly come to some interesting results in terms of corpus linguistics, that is looking at the actual words Timothy is using. And I want to share um, two examples of this. One is heavily indebted to Slavo, who helped me get a word count of individual letters of Timothy. And when we map out just simply the size of the individual letters within Timothy's surviving letter collection, we already get some very interesting results. One is the misdistribution. That is, that a small number of letters account for the majority of the corpus. For me, that's interesting in and of itself. But where I think this becomes super interesting is to combine the size of those letters with what those letters are talking about. Before I made the tree graph that you see here, I first quickly divided the letters into either a category of primarily theological or primarily dealing with the day-to-day -day operation of the Church of the East. So, for example, Timothy's largest letter, Epistle 59, known as Timothy's Apology, deals with differences between early Christian and early Islamic theology, 
That clearly deals goes in the theology category. When we make this rather crude division, the correlation is incredibly striking. When Timothy focuses on something theological here in orange, he's incredibly long-winded. When he deals with the day-to-day -day operations of his church here in blue, his epistles are much, much shorter. So even at the level of word count, we're able to find in interesting historical results when we analyze Timothy's corpus. But then when we get to the actual words, seeing things become even more compelling. For folks who do corpus linguistics, often the, our initial instinct to focus on words of content may be misleading. Uh, for example, Timothy speaks about water one-fifth as often as the average Syriac author. Probably he's just not talking a lot about water. But when we look at other words, things become more interesting. I've given here in tabular data a number of words that are heavily overrepresented in Timothy's corpus, focusing on those words that are tied with issues of argumentative prose, rhetorical sophistication, Greek loanwords. Um, notice things, for example, like Malone, which is used eight times more than average Syriac author, in great part because this is how Timothy often will make a comparison. Or things like Dane, here that's overrepresented in the corpus, almost certainly because of him favoring a mundane construction. So this sort of overrepresentation of a corpus gives us some idea of Timothy's actual style from a distance. Now, one could easily object that obviously when you're writing a letter, you're going to write in prose different um, than an Ephraim poetry. And so here I ran a very quick control experiment, comparing the same words in Timothy's corpus to that of another letter corpus, that of another Catholicos Ischio III. When we make this comparison, the numbers change a bit. But the overall picture of what words are heavily overrepresented in Timothy's corpus remains the same. So, too, that division between those letters that are primarily theological that Timothy writes and his day to day letters, that division is also reflected in individual words that become overrepresented in one part of the corpus versus another. So if we look at those that I've categorized as theological, we see heavy overrepresentation of words like servant, because Timothy writes over a hundred pages on why it's okay to call Christ a servant, or words that seem to have strong theological reflections, things like word, God, Christ, divine, nafsha. If we switch to the everyday letters, we saw different words that are overrepresented. Sergius appears 50 times as often, uh, reminding us that most of the day-to-day -day letters are addressed to him. But ecclesiastical terms, terms of restriction or law, or even something like more, which occurs 16 times as often, simply reminding us of how often people are referred to in the subcorpus of everyday letters versus theological letters. All of these give us fairly important information that simply couldn't have been done without Simto. Now, I have to admit, the sort of corpus linguistics that I shared with you is incredibly simplistic and incredibly low-hanging fruit. Um, it was done quite literally in just a couple of hours. And that's part of the point, that Simto allows us to do a sort of basic corpus linguistics quite quickly that have never been done before in Syriac Christianity. I want to illustrate on how even that basic corpus linguistics can have important results when we're looking at the work of a single author or within a single time period, especially with Simto 3 and additional national language processing. One can get even more interesting results. I just wanted to share some of these preliminaries. George, as you note, asked us to give a little critique or suggestions for what goes further with Simto. I'm just going to end with the last 30 seconds of this. Some of this has already been addressed in the third release. 
But one thing that affected my research initially was that we do have cases where we have multiple editions of a given author like Timothy or like Thomas of Marga, and initially both were in Simto overrepresenting that corpus. Um, this is something that I know is being corrected. What becomes very important for the sort of analysis that I shared today is something that at least in Simto 2 wasn't always present, which is divisions between things within a given corpus, like different letters, so that one can look at individual letters against each other, or in something like Thomas of Marga, where the Book of Governor has a six individual books, to have those divided so we can divide so that one can compare parts within a given author to other parts of that author's corpus. And then finally, we hear a lot more about this later, but additional natural language processing is just going to allow for much more, more powerful and much more nuanced analysis. Again, what I'm showing with you are incredibly preliminary results, but I'm hoping it can serve as a crude case example for how Simto can be used, not simply in terms of finding texts, or in terms of lexicography, but also increasingly can be used for corpus linguistics and how that can be tied to very specific projects and historical results. Thanks so much for letting me nerd out with Timothy for a bit with you and share some very preliminary results of this project and its connection with Simto. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. This is very useful. We hope you enjoyed the Simto tutorials. Our Miltho lab team in the Middle East continues manually correcting OCR to text to give you access to more accurate texts. The Miltho lab operation is entirely supported by donations, and it provides young men and women in the Middle East with much needed employment during a time of local crisis. Our project also promotes pride in their heritage as workers contribute to promoting their own culture.